Hi, listeners. Happy 2020. We actually released this episode early on our Patreon, which we've since updated and made a little bit more streamlined and easier. So if you'd like to support us starting at $1 a month, you can access written pop culture commentary from us that doesn't make it into the show, behind the scenes stuff, and early access to episodes like these. Thank you. Um, okay. So the goal is to keep this as clean and tight so that I don't have to do that much work. Yes. <laughs> also, I feel like I should use my NPR voice when I'm using this microphone. I feel like I need to just talk like this. I, I don't know. need to be that close to the microphone. No, I know. Here's what I'm thinking. We need a disclaimer because some of the shows and movies that we talk about have sexual content, so that's issue number one. Okay. I mean, we don't talk in depth about any of them. That's these are not, these are recommended for, I don't know, what, ages 15, <laughs> like adults, <laughs> some of them. So this is only best of 2019 because uh, things that we watched in 2019, although an awful lot of them were also released in 2019, because I am extremely stressed out by best of decade stuff. I was literally listening to a best of decade TV show podcast and it got me so stressed. Like they hadn't even gotten to the countdown yet. I was <laughs> like, I can't. This is too, there's too much. They were arguing over like the year at least best. I don't remember enough of the decade to like... I was 12, 10 years ago. <laughs> like, what have you accomplished this decade? I don't know, puberty? Like, <laughs> entire middle, high school, and college. So first, let's talk about what Culture Pop Open has accomplished in 2019. Oh, yay. Because this has been a big year for us. It is the only year for us. <laughs> so far. <laughs> so in 2019, we, one, started a podcast, which began as a joke in our text. And then I was like, wait, we can do this. And you were like, yeah. And I was like, yeah. Oh my so God. We released five episodes this year that so got better and better. This will be number six, but it'll be our first episode of the new decade. We also did the Tony thing that's on our Patreon. Yeah. And the Big okay. After Show, which will be on our Patreon. We also recorded three that were not released, one of which we forgot to download. <laughs> yeah. They're not failures. They are learning opportunities. <laughs> 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 and on that note, we ironed out so many technical kinks this year, both in the recording process, the editing process, figuring out Libsyn and our podcast distribution. And related to that, we now have multiple episodes on Spotify. So if you are a Spotify user and you're listening on this on another platform, go listen to us on Spotify. We established a small but growing social media presence, which we hope to build upon in 2020. And we did all of this together and don't hate each other yet, which is a miracle. Yes. Do you okay, want an so. overview of how this is going to work? Yes, I refuse okay. to rank things. Most things are in the order that they came to mind or like I tend to go chronologically when I look back on the year. So some of that is like that, especially the books, because I was literally just scrolling back through Goodreads. Anyway, so we're going to go over our favorite TV, books movies, musical, or theater in general. And then also our favorite other things that didn't fit into any of those categories. And we're going to start with like things released in 2019 slash that had episodes of 2019. So like, you know, like a season was in 2019 that we may have watched only that season or the whole thing. Also things that we love both together individually and then things not released in 2019. That we also loved. So it sounds like a lot, but we have this very organized. So we are just going to ask that you sit on this ride with us as we go back through 2019 and what we watched. 
and red. How was your 2019 in what? general? Did you just ask me how my 2019 was? Yeah. You uh, know, for the so podcast. My 2019 was interesting, I guess. Um, I finished grad school and graduated, and then I did a summer of editing a book, although I'm not sure where I'm at with my writing right now, so we're not going to talk about that. And then I started working in theater, so that was my 2019, and a lot of depression and anxiety. My 2019 was just, like, super long. (laughs) I had two very long semesters of, like, my entire English ed concentration and cohort and didn't do as much of other stuff as I wanted so 2020 is like my big transition year but it's been very long like I kept looking back at other things I was like oh I did read that book this year I read like 80 books this year yes but next year 2020 is even longer because it's a leap year (laughs) (laughs) I'm gonna be older so it'll go faster okay we are going to start with our favorite tv shows of 2019 So probably one of the most central TV shows that Olivia and I both loved this year was Fleabag, which is streaming on Amazon Prime. And it is a TV show about a British woman who uses casual sex to deal with her trauma and fears about intimacy and relationships. And we have an entire episode about it. So you should definitely listen to that if you haven't already. Yeah. And this isn't just us. This is kind of like... 2019 was kind of the world of flu bag as far as television was going because like nothing was quite like it technically only the second season was released this year but a lot of people watch both including us it's very funny and iconic and moving and we love phoebe waller bridge we were also obsessed with the good place which is on nbc and it is streaming on netflix and hulu It is a show about a group of strangers who end up somewhere called The Good Place and through a series of mishaps and adventures learn lessons about friendship, life, love, death, and what it means to be human. I watched the entire series this year. And I watched the episodes that came out this year, which were the end of season three and season four, which has probably some of my favorite, like, revelations and commentary and everything, but I will not spoil anything but we have an episode coming soon and we're going to have a special guest for that so our good friend cody rucker is going to be hey. so hi cody we know you're listening <laughs> i hope so <laughs> you better be <laughs> okay <Hey>. yay <laughs> another show that we really loved this year was pose which is on fx and season one is currently streaming on netflix season two came out this year and we both really loved it It is a show about a group of trans women and queer people of color who are living in late 1980s and 1990s New York City as they navigate love, friendship, and self-worth in the midst of the AIDS epidemic and while participating in the ball scene. Yeah, so you watch both seasons because it appeared on Netflix this summer, right before the second season premiered, and I watched... I rewatched some of that, but mostly I watched the second season, what came out this year since I've been a fan since last year and really love rooting for these characters and I appreciated seeing all the real history of the ACT UP movement highlighted, but also fictionalized over this last season. And there's just all these bizarre and kind of funny moments based on reality. Like there's a mummy in a closet. That's all I'm going to say. So there's so many amazing performances, including musical from MJ Rodriguez and Billy Porter and Angelica Ross and India Moore. And the ending is perfect. There are definitely sad moments because of the subject matter but ultimately it's very joyful which is something i haven't it's a show that is kind of unlike a lot of on service similar shows about the same subject matter and we have an episode on that as yeah, well. yeah we do on season one and watch yeah, watch season one and then you can listen to the episode and then you have to go find season two okay so another one that made both of our lists was barry from the hbo we both watched both seasons this year i've been kind of it's been on my radar since it came out last year at the beginning uh, it was like march i thought i would enjoy it but i didn't expect to like think about it as much as I did and still do. So basically Bill Hader also created the show and directed it and writes it is a depressed and traumatized hitman formerly in the military who discovers actual purpose in his life by taking an acting class on one of his hits. But the ultimate question is can he kind of escape that world? And uh, I watched it actually twice because the first time I didn't pay enough attention because I'm not that interested in like mob stories. So I didn't notice all of the satiric elements that they're actually making fun of mobs. 
um, and like those kind of characters. There's like so many weird characters like Noho Hank that has the best use of text messages. We all want a hug from Henry Winkler, who plays the acting teacher. Sally's storyline in season two has lots of depth and good acting from both of them. And we just really want to know what happens next because it seems to be a lot about how difficult it is, if possible, to escape a cycle of violence and how toxic violent environments can be and like what even is a good person. Also, there's an episode that aired this year called Ronnie Lilly, which is pure WTF <laughs> Yeah. And another show that we both love this year, which is streaming on Netflix in the US, but it's actually broadcast in the UK, is Dairy Girls. So I watched season two. I believe. And then I watched both seasons. So Dairy Girls is about a group of Catholic Irish girls and one of their English Protestant cousins as they navigate the turbulence of adolescence and deal with family, boys, girls, school, and more against the backdrop of the troubles in Dairy, London Dairy in Northern Ireland. Basically, it's like a comedy and every episode is completely like has such a high premise and then it like goes off the rails every time. And somehow it gets away with not having to like deal with that at the beginning of the next episode like it's just amazing <laughs> it's interesting too because there is like some kind of overarching narrative that i won't spoil yeah yeah time it's so episodic it works it's really good we we will have an episode on it at one point yes okay and then we have Shit's Creek, which Tay just started watching for the podcast yay so i started watching it i think three days ago and i'm already <laughs> on episode of 10 of season four and i'm like mildly obsessed (laughs) (laughs) there is a twitter thread of her notes i have to update it but it's like her notes and you just see the progression of her being skeptical to like in love and then you like even more in love so i also watched all the episodes this year because i had just kind of recently heard about it it's streaming on netflix at least in the united states it's a production of the cbc in canada and in the u.s it airs on pop and season six is going to begin like in a week at the beginning of january so it's basically a rich cookie family that loses all their money and then has to live in a motel in this titular town it is spelled s-c-h-i-t-t apostrophe s just to be clear (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's funny when you watch them do interviews and some of the broadcast networks can't like actually say the name (laughs) or they have to put it on the screen every time anyway yeah we're gonna have an episode soon about that but also season five specifically aired this year and i want to say that's maybe my favorite with lots of musical moments a great stevie arc there's a episode where patrick comes out to his parents and that was basically unlike any representation i've seen before but also so true like it's the idea that you know that things are going to be 99 percent okay but it still changes things so you kind of avoid it so we also had some individual favorites that maybe the other person has seen some of it but it they don't like it as much or they haven't seen it yet so now we're going to talk about our individual TV favorites. So I am going to start with mine. So one of my favorite TV shows had the first half of their final season come out this year, which is BoJack Horseman, which is an original Netflix animated series. So the titular character is a horse with substance abuse problems, and season six is all about his journey in rehab. And the show also looks at depression and motherhood really well this season, and it's one of my it's one of the few shows with explicit asexual rep through Todd, who may have finally met his match on his asexual dating app, All About That Ace. So I'm really excited for the final installment to come out in 2020 and see what they're going to do with these characters. It's definitely one of the shows where if you want to get into it, I recommend binge watching the first three seasons in like two days because they're not as strong as the later seasons. But I think the show does a really good job at exploring relevant issues through a very particular type of deadpan humor. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you also he used to be like a TV star, right? Yeah, he's a he's a washed out 90s sitcom TV star. There are both humans and horses and, and like, animals. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Just to say, you were like, he's a horse. <laughs> I was like, so, yeah, I've seen the first episode, and the first one I ever saw was the other one I've seen, which was the underwater one. We watched it in a class I was in. I love the underwater episode so much. Yeah. So, it's on my list. I don't know if there will be an episode on it, but we'll see once Olivia starts watching. <laughs> it's, it's definitely a good show 
for conversation about culture and identity and mental health. So Yay. we'll see. I like those things. So I mean. <laughs> that was my <laughs> plight plug. Another show that Olivia and I have both seen, but I like way more than she does, is Big Mouth, which is a show about a bunch of middle schoolers navigating sex and sexuality for the first time with the help of their hormone monsters, and it focuses on the three main characters, Nick, Andrew, and Jesse. Season 3 came out this year and really fumbled with the bi-slash-pan discussion, which the writers did acknowledge, but it also kind of left a dark cloud over the season a little bit for me. And the show in general has done a great job breaking down tough subjects such as body image, mental health, and masturbation in a funny way. This season was really about toxic masculinity, and I'm really excited for season four and the spinoff, Human Resources, that's going to be a workplace comedy about the world of the monsters from the end of season two. Like Depression Kitty. Yeah. I- I I don't like not like this show. I like it a lot, and then I watch it all when when every season comes out, and then I immediately like forget about it. Like when season three was coming out, I like genuinely didn't remember where the characters were in their stories. Yeah, this season I'm just was probably like again like the way they handled sexualities wasn't my favorite, especially something that tries to be so informative. Their like song about different sexualities was just completely off and. The pan thing was frustrating. It, like, brought up a point and then went to make another point, and they never addressed the first point. Anyway. That's Big Mouth. Yeah. <laughs> show that made one giant point through one giant explosion was Chernobyl, <laughs> <laughs> which was a limited series on HBO. And I basically watched this because all of my coworkers were watching it, and it only made my list because Emily Watson is so good in it. And the show does a really good job at exploring the ways that human ignorance and oversight can have tremendously negative effects on the environment and other people. And in general, it was fairly well researched. It was a little over sensationalized when it comes to the visual presentation of acute radiation poisoning, but other than that, it was really good. Yeah, I have no interest in watching that. <laughs> you were like, Tay, hey, why are you doing this to yourself? And I'm like, I started it. I have to finish. Yeah. It's very graphic. Do not watch if you're not into, like, graphic body horror at certain points. And then, okay, so the rest of these are going to be going in the opposite direction of body horror. I watch a lot of food documentaries and docuseries i watch a lot of food network too like more the competition stuff but this year i kind of really fell for watching shows that made me have a deeper appreciation of food as a nexus for understanding human connection human culture and human identity so there's four shows in particular that i really love and these are all available on netflix to watch the first is ugly delicious which is david chang's show So he is the chef that owns a group of noodle bars, and he was kind of the first person to kind of bring Asian food up to the status of high dining in New York City. So he's a big deal. So it's a show where he talks about a specific food and explores the history and availability of that food for different class levels and cultures. So the first episode is on pizza, and it's one of my favorites. There's an episode on tacos. There's an episode on fried rice, barbecue. There's a whole Thanksgiving episode about home cooking where he discusses where the title of the show comes from. And then there's a debate at the end of the season about stuffed pasta versus Asian dumplings. There's going to be season two, and I know they finished Mm -hmm. in the summer, and I guess they have to, like, go through everything. They do a lot of traveling for the show, so. Yeah, there's a lot of celebrities, too. Yes. So Aziz Ansari is on it, Ali Wong makes an appearance, Jimmy Kimmel's on it. There's a lot of celebrity chefs and actual celebrities on it. It's really great. Along with celebrities, David Chang also released a series this year called Breakfast, Lunch, and Dinner. It's a limited series where he gets breakfast, lunch, and dinner in a different city with a different celebrity in each episode. So in the first episode, he goes to Vancouver with Seth Rogen, which actually has some of the best writing advice that I've ever seen (laughs) in the show. So I highly recommend watching that if you're a creative person. He goes to Morocco with Chrissy Teigen. He goes to L.A with Lena Waithe and then he goes to Cambodia with Kate McKinnon so it's a variety of things now does the title of the show have the Oxford comma in it uh I don't know (laughs) I'm bugging Tay about this because she refuses to use the Oxford comma even though we are in America 
she's looking it up. <laughs> it does not. It has an ampersand and no Oxford comma, so suck it, Oxford comma fans. <laughs> <laughs> Um, another food show that I really like this year because I'm a huge taco fan. So if you watch the taco episode, it's really delicious. And then want more tacos, watch the Taco Chronicles on Netflix, which is a limited series that talks about the social and political history of a different type of show in Mexico across six episodes. It's really great. It has really great representation across various indigenous groups in Mexico. Highly recommend. And then the last series that I watched this summer, I think, while I was putting together my bookshelves, was Street Food. And that show explores the rich street food culture in Asia. And each episode is on a different city in a different Asian country. And it explores three to four street food vendors in those locations. And it does a really good job of documenting food cultures that are at great risk of disappearing or not continuing. For example, a lot of the Indonesian street vendors who make desserts are between the ages of 80 and 100. So those cultures and traditions are at great risk of disappearing. And I think the show does a really great job of documenting it in a respectful way that doesn't totally fall into the colonialist gaze issue. So I want Olivia to watch at least some of these shows so that we can have a food docuseries episode, since I think it's a fruitful discussion. <laughs> she started the first episode of Ugly Delicious, so we'll see. Even you talking about it makes me hungry. <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can handle this. Okay, so my turn is uh, scripted shows. <laughs> um, because apparently that's all I watch. Um, so the first one that came out at the beginning of this year is The Other Two from Comedy Central, which I call the latest entry in new comedies. These are by former SNL writers Chris Kelly and Sarah Schneider about people becoming better people, even if... At least one of the characters in this show is kind of goes on a downward spiral first. So it's about the 30-year-old, like, floundering siblings, Carrie, who is a struggling actor. For instance, at the beginning, he's auditioning for Man Who Smells Fart in a commercial. Um, their one note is, like, to make it sound less gay. <laughs> he's just like, what? <laughs> and Brooke, who is, like, a lot like Eleanor in The Good Place, honestly, like, not even, including, like, kind of looking like her. She has all those kind of vibes where she's not like terrible terrible but it's kind of terrible she literally gets fired and there's nowhere to live at the beginning so they have to kind of reevaluate their lives because their 13 year old little brother who goes by chase dreams his name is chase it becomes like a justin bieber like famous from his youtube song marry you at recess the the kind of twist on it which a lot of these comedies do like schitt's creek and the good place and brooklyn 99 where they kind of don't go the easy route in comedy and deal with something more human is that he's a really sweet kid and they genuinely love him but the industry really uses him and there are parody songs such as my brother's gay and that's okay there are countless references to like gay male culture including a band of insta gays and carrie's story is like maybe the best exploration of internalized homophobia that i've seen on tv so i'm excited for the second season and where they go which should be coming out soonish so i also have the end of craziest girlfriend here which um i forgot to make notes for <laughs> so i don't remember exactly which air episodes aired in 2019 but it but the end in general i found pretty satisfying and wrap things up while also avoiding tr i don't want to spoil it so there were some great parodies my personal favorite this past season was antidepressants are so not a big deal <laughs> and yeah i found that satisfying brooklyn 99 which now went to nbc and you can find it streaming on hulu came back for season six which i don't think was my favorite but it also had moments that I loved. One Day at a Time on Netflix, which has since been, I'm so glad it got picked up by Pop for another season because I need more with these characters. And season three, I think I loved the most. So it's about a human family sitcom. There's an episode called Anxiety that really hit me. And there's great explorations of queer sex, consent, and alcoholism. And I'm so glad we're going to get more with those characters. And Rito Moreno is hilarious. <laughs> I have Star Trek Discovery question mark question mark because I don't think it all aired this year, but I really did enjoy the second season more than the first. And I just kind of had to go back and rewatch stuff because I was trying to watch it while doing homework and that was bad because <laughs> I got really lost. I also enjoyed this year watching random weird old Star Trek episodes <laughs> that I joked I would make Tate watch. Mostly I just text her. 
I might end up watching weird Star Trek episodes in exchange for Olivia watching weird old Degrassi Next Generation episodes. So we'll see if there's going to be a <laughs> childhood genre swap. The, the Next Generation. <laughs> Star Trek and Degrassi. Can we do that episode together? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like that would hit, like, a lot of niche fan groups that would, like, really bring together a lot of things. It's like, here are 90 shows, and they're both called The Next Generation, and we're both going to try to explain the plots completely out of context to each other. And try to explain, like, why these two shows mean so much to us. <laughs> <laughs> um, another big thing this year was the second season of Mindhunter, which I definitely liked a lot more than season one. Like, really really gone into compared to the first season it's about the early days of the behavioral science unit at the FBI. I was really interested in all the sociopolitics explored about the Atlantic child murders, which I really I'd heard about, but I didn't know that much about. And then there's this whole like question of like, what do you do if you notice signs of a psychopath in a child, which is fun to think about <laughs> as someone who wants to work with children and thinks they're all like good. Anna Torv is in it. She's my favorite from Fringe. And one of the reasons I started the show in the first place. And her character, Wendy, deals with a toxic relationship with another woman and the strain of how she can't be out at her job since it's, like, the 1970s. Uh, Jonathan Groff is in it as, like, the main character, although he doesn't sing, but we love him. So <laughs> uh, I really appreciated how David Fincher, the director, frames, like, so much of the show is just these long conversations, but they're often done in, like, public places, and they actually have background noise or, like, awkward pauses while, like, someone is walking through with another prisoner they like pause their conversation like realistic things like that and it makes it just really fascinating even though they're literally just talking another show that i know is huge for everyone right now is watchmen on hbo which i just kind of stumbled across i don't even know how to describe it um because i've never read the graphic novel it's ultimately kind of a sequel to that I did start the graphic novel. I got like three of the issues in, but I needed to return it and it was finals week. So that didn't go well. Regina King is amazing and it spotlights the intergenerational trauma of racism. It was really cathartic to watch white, white supremacists get murdered, but it's also, I really liked how they kind of discussed how human evil perhaps like never can be defeated. So there were great character pieces throughout. It's by Damon Lindelof who did Lost and also The Leftovers, which I'm going to talk about later. So there's a lot of those like singular point of view episodes and there's a lot of jumping around through different time. And the boldest thing is that they say they really don't want to make a second season. In the summer, I was briefly into Stranger Things 3 because it was my favorite of the three seasons so far. Apparently, this is an uncommon opinion, but I care more about the characters than the actual plot, which clearly like whatever, Um, (laughs) mostly because it actually has Robin a gay character, finally, and there were more, like, interactions between the female characters, which is one of the major glaring blind spots of the previous season, and I got really attached to Will at the beginning because they seemed to be hinting that he's, like, gay or ace, and I think they want him to be, or, like, their ideas that he's gay, and, but I don't know if I trust them how to handle it, so I was like, how are they going to do this? And then they didn't really, anyway, because it's the 80s and it's complicated. Um, Hopper's character totally regressed, and I was super uncomfortable with him abusing his authority with violence, so FYI. And I also watched his own materials, the BBC production with money kicked in from HBO. (laughs) It's clearly like a BBC show. I don't know how else to describe it. It has its moments. The books are just super big and nostalgic for me, so I was like, even the flaws people point out, I was like, yeah, it's just, it's just exactly like the books. Mostly, I've been waiting 10 years for the second two adaptations, so I'm more excited for that, and I was really excited when, like, one of the major characters, Will, actually appeared in this season, even though the pacing was weird, so. <sighs> uh, the other one. <laughs> we should have, like, alternated. We should have alternated. I guess you can do that if you really want to with editing. But, no, uh, probably not. <laughs> You should leave this bit in so we acknowledge the flaws. All With right. the books, we'll go back and forth. Talk about leftovers. Okay, another major show I watch. I watch a lot of TV, guys. I was trying to use up my HBO subscription from my university before I graduate. I've been meaning to watch this show since the final season came out in 2017 and all of the critics were talking about it, and it's, like, so worth it. I knew this first season was supposedly not as good, but I still broadly enjoyed it, but then I definitely loved the second and then the third one even more. 
because it just gets better and weirder. It's about 2% of the world's population just disappearing and everyone having to cope with it through things like religion and cults and divorce and uh, hiring prostitutes to shoot you in a bulletproof vest. And then, like, they all have to try to piece together this life in spite of questions that that just will never be answered. So it features things like perfect music cues, episodes focusing on particular characters and point of views, the main character dying to become an international assassin in a hotel not once, but maybe up to three times, and he always comes back, and maybe he's the second coming. And... (laughs) It's weird. (laughs) And then there's also this episode in the third season that might have been my favorite. That's like a really heavy episode about religion and faith, but it takes place on a Tasmanian boat rented out by a lion-based sex cult. And there's this grumpy guy claiming he's God and uh, straight up throwing a man overboard. So it's a lot. And if you thought that was a lot, imagine Olivia live texting you while she's watching all of Oh, yeah. In the beginning of that episode, I was like, why is someone clearly running naked at the camera? And then he, like, sets off the nuclear bomb in France. And that's, like, a minor thing. They're just like, oh, there's been an explosion. (laughs) Anyway, Carrie Coon is a great actress. Okay. So, we watched a lot of TV. We also read a lot of books, which is surprising considering how busy we both were. I mean, I think books are kind of our first love, so... That's true. We also pushed each other to read a lot of these books, which we're now going to alternate. (laughs) Yeah, well, these are the books that we both loved that were also released in 2019. So I'm starting. (laughs) Okay. So Dave Goodbye as King is kind of at the top of both of our lists. It's literally the reason we started this podcast, because we were texting each other about it. And then we both had early copies, and it hadn't been released yet. So we were, like, both reading it over, like, this period of three days. I was, like, on spring break. And we were just, like, obsessed with it. We kind of failed at making the episode, but uh, because we weren't sure what a spoiler or not. But, yeah, we're still here. <laughs> it's, like, a surrealist book about five grandchildren of strange former potato farmers. And it has a lot to do with class, race, gender, and, like, what the current generation of, like, teenagers can do to support each other and make culture and the world in America like more inclusive and kind of reverse these problems that their grandparents kind of instigated. So it's like multi-generational, lots of point of views. It's basically A.S. King's masterpiece, generally because it's my favorite favorite, but also because it deals with all of the topics and just so many characters and just like all comes together. Much yeah. recommend. So another book that we both loved and that we read together or very shortly, one after the other, this summer was The Mighty Heart of Sunny St. James by Ashley Herring Blake. It is her sophomore upper middle grade novel about a girl, Sunny St. James, who gets a heart transplant and then falls in love with a girl who moves to her small southern island as she starts to do all of the things that she couldn't do before the transplant and she struggles to reconnect with her estranged mom. This book, I read this first. And then I pushed Tay to read it because it had me like so on edge during the last part because I didn't know exactly what would happen because I could see like multiple outcomes, especially as like a middle grade book about discovery and like can't explain why because spoilers, but how it handled that made it my favorite queer girl middle grade so far. I don't know if you agree because we <laughs> Oh no, I agree. Remember, I almost threw the book in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember that, but I know you also read like Ivy and you talk about that one a lot too so i mean i read a lot of queer girl middle grade i don't know if i can assign a favorite because there's just so much yeah i just think like reading them well you read a lot that i'd read previous years this year yeah like starcrossed and uh, ivy aberdeen and so like because of that like because i'd been through where a certain thing happens in those books sort of with the end like i didn't wasn't sure if it was going to be like that or if it was going to go like a step further with this ending and then it did and i was happy so like i needed that like two years of context (laughs) <laughs> okay, so another one is The Year We Fell from Space by Amy Sari King, who is also A.S. King, who wrote Dig. This is an upper middle grade about a girl, Liberty, whose parents get divorced. And then uh, there's a meteor shower. She drags a meteor that's like 130 pounds in her room, and it talks to her. <laughs> it makes sense, I promise. So she's coming to grips with her dad's depression, her parents' divorce, and like her own sadness, which might also be depression. And so it's kind of about just not being okay. <laughs> Speaking of multi-generational mental illness, we also both read a YA book 
this year called How It Feels to Float by Helena Fox. It is a book about Biz, an Australian teenager whose dad died by suicide, and then Biz goes on a road trip with her new kind of friend Jasper to find out more about his past and come to grips with her own mental illness. It has my favorite last page of any novel that I read this year, and Olivia also really appreciated that it had complicated, probably platonic, but with so much love relationship between Biz and Jasper, and that's also something that I really loved about the book. Um, It has questioning sexuality, but because Biz has so much other stuff going on in her life, it's not really something that comes up again and again, but I still appreciated that it was there. And it also has a hilarious and sometimes inappropriate 87-year-old woman who becomes Biz's friend. Okay, so the next book on both of our lists, which I was lucky enough to read in ARC like digital arc and then Tay was like desperately trying to get it the day it was released <laughs> is Brave Face by Sean David Hutchinson. This one's actually a memoir, nonfiction YA about his journey of realizing that he was both gay and depressed as a teenager and those things like aren't related although of course his depression and his internalized homophobia kind of collaborated to tell him he wasn't worth it, love or anything but it also deals with a suicide attempt and how he started to move forward so we particularly love how he Hutchison highlights how the media landscape of gay characters either which was kind of in this binary back in the 90s which again the readers including us really <laughs> weren't alive for so he really contextualizes his history and talks about how like you either saw the effeminate joke or this tragic promiscuous AIDS victim like drugs and stuff and that influenced his understanding of himself and his actions towards others because of his internalized homophobia. Uh, so Hutchinson is also part of the asexual spectrum Um he is Demi but in Brayface he explains pretty explicitly the feelings of being Demi which was something that I really appreciated while reading the book but he doesn't use the label because he didn't have the language yet and he chose not to put it in there um there's also two trigger warnings and there there's a trigger warning at the beginning or a content warning rather that is really helpful and then there's a jump trigger warning which i used and olivia didn't and we both had wonderful experiences with the book so it's something that we hope publishing continues to do moving forward yeah and it was really great to reach that even though i was planning on reading the whole thing like but there was so many times early in the book where i was worried like oh is it gonna happen like now but then when i got to that part i was like oh okay so like now i know it's happening so another book that we both love Deposing Nathan by Zach Smedley. And now Zach is kind of our friend. At least he's my friend. Um, <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> friend of the podcast. <laughs> You'll be on here at some point. So <laughs> Supposing Nathan is a gritty YA contemporary slash thriller that's about a boy, Nathan, who starts to fall for a new boy in town, Cam, and their budding relationship causes chaos in Nathan's personal and family life. And oh yeah, it's told through the lens of a deposition after Cam stabs Nathan. So yeah. It's great. It also uses the C word perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Supposing Nathan is such a good buy coming out and discovery story that I don't think we've seen much of before in YA. Yeah, especially because when you say that someone's falling for a guy, you're like, oh, he's gay because bisexual invisibility is real. Yeah, but no, Nathan is definitely like one of the biased books that I read this year. Yeah, and every time you think it's going to fall into a trap, like one of the characters points that out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Also on both of our lists is Like a Love Story by Abdi Nazemian. This is a book told in three perspectives. It's a YA book from characters Riza, Judy, and Art. And these are three teenagers growing up falling in and out of love in 1990s New York City against the backdrop of getting involved in ACT UP and AIDS activism. Riza initially falls for Judy to deal with the fact that he knows he's gay. And then he falls for Art and thinks it's complicated, but it's ultimately like this really beautiful book and has so much great history and culture in it that we can all it was just the perfect thing to read when Poe season two came out yes like both of those things it was a great pride month <laughs> <laughs> so also on our favorite list of books this year is I Wish You All the Best by Mason Deaver. It is a own voices contemporary novel about the turbulent coming out of a non-binary teenager, Ben DeBacker, and how they find their voice through art and they fall in love with a sweet queer boy named Nathan, not 
Nathan from Deposing Nathan, is <laughs> pretty and soft all at once, and it has a great exploration of bisexuality that was the best that Olivia had seen in YA, and it also yeah. goes into mental health and therapy. Yeah, well, especially as it deals with gender and what by being bisexual means compared to, say, the uh, Big Mouth episode. Yeah. <laughs> this idea that, like, what does two genders mean, two or more, et cetera. Anyway, to switch gears a bit, it, we have Guts by Raina Telgemeier, which is this cute and sweet middle grade graphic novel about a tween Raina, so it's it's her memoir, who experiences stomach issues as a result of her anxiety. And it was very relatable for me because I definitely experienced stomach issues as a re- result of my anxiety. Sometimes I feel like I'm going to throw up, but it's not like the extent. But yeah, this is a hugely popular book right now, and I'm so glad it is. Okay. <laughs> Another book that we both loved and read early copies of was Redwood and Ponytail by K.A. Holt. It's a very, 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 very soft upper middle grade. It's told in dual perspective verse about two girls, Redwood and Ponytail, who discover their queer identity and they fall in love. And it's punctuated by these chorus of three girls that reminded me a lot of the three witches in Macbeth. Yeah, it's like a Greek chorus kind of thing. Yeah, who comments on their relationship. And I think this might have been my favorite queer girl middle grade of 2019. I think it did something special by showing both sides and both perspectives in one novel Mm -hmm. and just showing, like, it felt more intimate than a lot of the upper middle grade novels that I've read this year. Yeah. I mean, even though it's in verse, I did feel like I had, like, a good sense of grounding, which I don't always feel with books in verse. And, yeah. It's really good to just, they have different environments, but ultimately they have, like, supportive people they can turn to. Mm -hmm. And just, it also kind of deals with the, like, what is feminine, masculine, like, that kind of thing. And then another book from this year on both of our lists is With the Fire and High by Elizabeth Acevedo. Um, This is the author of The Hot X, and it's her sophomore book, although this one's not in verse. It's a novel. I also listen to the audiobook, which she reads, and I recommend um, about a teen mom, her name is Imani, whose cooking has a touch of magic, so there's this little bit of magical realism, uh, as she navigates her senior year and begins to find her own voice again in the midst of, like, co-parenting, finishing school, dealing with her family, she, uh, falls in love, and it's pretty cute, and, like, she loves, it's a very good cooking book, too. Yeah. And a great, like, senior year book. Okay, why don't you do one from your list, and then I'll do one. I only have two that came out. We're going to switch to things that we tried individually that came out this year. Okay. So one of my favorite 2019 books that I really want Olivia to read, but she has not yet, and it's fine, is Lovely (laughs) Paper by Julie Berry. It is a historical fantasy that's set in New York City during World War II, where after she gets caught having an affair with Ares, the god of war, by her husband, Hephaestus, the goddess of love, Aphrodite, Tell the story of love, death, music, and war across World War One. She's telling the story in World War Two, but the story happens in World War One. Oh, so it's okay. kind of like a framed book where they're in this hotel room in Manhattan, and she's telling the story. So it's from Aphrodite's point of view, and it's about these two couples. And it's a really great book because it's such a masterful weaving of different narratives where you have all these characters that you don't really understand how they're going to connect, and then they do. And it has probably the softest and best written first kiss of any book that I've read in 2019. Okay. Um, Also on my list is On the Come Up by Angie Thomas, which is her second novel, Following the Hate You Give. It follows Brie, who wants to be a rapper, and her family's kind of struggling with poverty and she just you know wants to like be successful and she's dealing with a lot <laughs> this book is very long and it deals with so much that i think it, it's just very much like that you give us such a well-rounded community family friends school i listen to this audiobook and i also really recommend that because you can hear the raps and it's ultimately like characters that i was really really rooting for and just really felt like i was in 
like their world and there were so many different perspectives very much like our first book so i really recommend that so another book that i really love this year is reverie by ryan lasala it was the funnest book launch that i've been to this year there was a drag queen and we had to sing a song but the book video on twitter (laughs) where i'm in it but we don't talk about that so it is so reverie is an epic queer fantasy novel about a teen kane who loses his memories after a mysterious accident and then when he is trying to figure out who he is and what's going on he ends up getting back into fighting to contain out of control dream worlds called reveries with his friends or maybe his friends he doesn't know he doesn't trust them because he doesn't remember who they are and they work to fight a evil drag queen enchantress yay I'm going to read that soon. So um, the other one released in 2019 that I read and really loved was Shout by Laurie Hall Sanderson, which is in verse. It's like part memoir, part like reflections and poetry, not like a manifesto, but kind of. And she wrote Speak 20 years ago, which is about a girl dealing with the aftermath of being raped and she doesn't speak and doesn't want to tell anyone. And so this is about And that was kind of based on her own experience of being raped at like 15, very young. And so her story about that is very powerful and growing up and then also writing speak and seeing reactions to speak and people trying to ban it. So I definitely recommend that for some poetry. She's she's really good at the line breaks and like the sound and rhythm in poetry, which sometimes when you read in verse kind of like it feels like poetry like I wouldn't call it a novel in verse as much it's strong so I had five other books that I really enjoyed in 2019 the first is I hope you get this message by Farah Nasrishi the writing is so good this book I devoured in like a day And it is a surreal post-apocalyptic sci-fi where aliens deliberate over a week whether or not to save the human race. And they have nothing that they can do to change the aliens' minds. So in the midst of all this, three teenagers, Adim, Jesse, and Kate, um, kind of handle the last things that they want to take care of and confront a lot of their demons. And they start out really separate. And then their paths start to intertwine as society spirals into chaos. And they take care of their last wishes and come together. And it's really great. The writing is fantastic. I highly recommend it. So another book I really liked was Well Met by Jen DeLuca. It is a cute, smutty, renaissance fair romance about a woman who fell on rough times and she goes home to take care of her sister who broke her leg. And in the midst of all of this, she gets involved working as a pub wench at the local renaissance fair so her niece can participate because she needs an adult to kind of sign up with her. And she ends up maybe falling in love with the cute organizer of the fair who plays the lead pirate. I, re- I remember texting you when I was reading that book. Yeah, you did. Another book I liked was Scars Like Wings by Aaron Stewart, which is a contemporary YA about a teen who survives severe burns after her house catches on fire. And in the in that fire, she loses her best friend slash cousin and her parents. So now she loses her aunt and uncle who lost their daughter in the fire. So she's really scarred, and she is forced to go back to high school. And in the process of going back to high school, she ends up connecting with another burned survivor at the school who is going through her own trauma and issues and falls back in love with singing and musical theater. Another book I loved was You'd Be Mine by Erin Hahn. It's her debut book. All my other books have been debuts as well so far, I think. Except for Julie Berry's book. It's not her debut book. So You'd Be Mine is a sweet contemporary romance about a mega hit teen country heartthrob, uh, Clay Coolidge, who convinces a kind of quiet, out of the spotlight daughter of country music legends Annie Mathers to go out on tour with him during the summer. And on the road, the two begin to grow close. And as Annie's star begins to rise towards fame, Clay begins to collapse under the weight of his own weight and guilt and demons and has to deal with that. And then finally, in the middle grade age bracket, one of my favorite books this year was Hurricane Season by Nicole Melby, which is an upper middle grade novel about Fig, who feels the burden of making sure that her former piano playing dad, who is bipolar, is doing okay enough because CPS is kind of checking in on them. And in order to deal with all this, she looks to the life of Vincent Van Gogh for answers on how to take care of her dad. And she's struggling with her feelings for girls and her dad's falling for 
the kind neighbor and it's a really great sweet quirky weird book that takes place down the jersey shore yeah i really want to read her in season i have an arc of scars like wings which the way you described it made me more interested in it so it's finally get to that typical inspiration porn book i was surprised and which I is really- good yeah oh this one did come out this year Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston, which I'm not upset, as obsessed with as much as everyone else, I think. But it was a fun and funny read. What I really appreciated, especially, was that it didn't shy away with the consequences of international outings. So it's about in a world where <laughs> a woman becomes the president of the United States in 2016, who's from Texas and has a biracial son named Alex and is divorced. And that son is bisexual and kind of discovers that which is really good and kind of falls for the like prince henry yes harry's the real one who of the royal family <laughs> we just <laughs> i was like it is one of those two names and yeah so they kind of fall for each other um and i really like the message of how red states like texas as i mentioned this character is from produce marginalized people and their voices do matter and uh, sometimes politicians on you know, in this condition, you know, leftist politicians, like, forget about that. They're like, whatever, we'll give up on that state or something. So, um, I have a lot of books not released in 2019 because I'm still trying to catch up on things. So, Tay read this one in 2018 when it came out, which is Darius the Great is Not Okay. I read this at, like, the beginning of the year and it still stuck with me. It's this beautiful, quiet book about a half Iranian, half white American kid named Darius traveling to Iran for the first time and trying to figure out himself with his first real friendship and his tenuous relationship with his father, who is much more masculine than him. And they both have depression and take medication for that. And it features extensive opinions about tea, father, son, Star Trek, the next generation viewing, which obviously I appreciated, and taking antidepressants and gaining weight from them, which I also really appreciated. It made me very emotional. I took a James Baldwin seminar this past semester. So I had already read Giovanni's Room and I reread it. And I think that one's still my favorite of his novels, but I also really loved If Beale Street Could Talk, which is about a young black couple in the 1970s who are in love and she's pregnant, but he's been arrested for a crime that he didn't commit and they're like trying to get him out. And my favorite of his nonfiction is probably The Fire Next Time, A New Name in the Street, which are epic, meandering thoughts on the civil rights era and the various factions within it and all the reckoning that we need to do as America. On a Sunbeam by Tilly Walden, which is a graphic novel. It's epic and beautiful, and it's like the space opera, great colors, and it has a female-female love story in the middle of it that kind of ties, like, two different timelines together, and they're, like, told in different colors. Like, it's a really great use of graphic novel. It's got me more interested in, like, space-found families. (laughs) There's just a lot of Star Trek references in this. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Blanca e Roja or Aunt Roja by Anna Marie McLemore. It's an ampersand on purpose, which is this beautiful kind of retelling of, is it Snow White and Rose Red? Which yeah. is not the same as Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. It's a different Snow White. <laughs> <laughs> and Swan Lake. There are terrifying swans in this book. And just kind of deals with these two sisters and basically what one of them is going to turn into Swan and their parents kind of are like, well, this is the family curse. We're going to like abandon you. <laughs> and then there is a boy who can change into a bear sometimes and another kid who is genderqueer and named Paige, who we love. You read this last year. We love their books. This It just deals with fate very well. And it was great to read when I was obsessed with Hadestown. Okay, also the writing is gorgeous. It is probably well, one of the yes. most beautiful books I've ever read. But go on. <laughs> all of their writing and all of their books are gorgeous. I have Girl Made of Stars, which you also read last year, I think, which is Ashley Herring Blake's last YA book as of recently. Uh, we talked about her middle grade above. And it's about sexual assault and trauma, in which basically a girl's twin brother is accused of raping her best friend. And so she's dealing with the fallout of all of that. It sounds like something that could just turn into like a what if book, but this is really grounded in these specific characters and their specific community and their lives. It also has like some of the most nuanced relationship drama. I've seen like why do we come attached to people as though it's healthy and like it's a bi love triangle with a gender fluid character, which I loved. 
So on here, I also have The Sun is Also a Star, which basically I like to say if this were written by a man and published as literary fiction, it would be viewed as this masterpiece about identity and immigration and the attachments people form and like all these profound and existential questions that come up in it. But instead, because it's YA and by a woman, Nicole Yoon. And of color. Yeah. <laughs> it's insta love and cute even though the characters literally talk about how they see their relationship as a possibility rather than declare they're in love. Like, that's pretty clear. Anyway, I jumped on the Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo train. I listened to the audiobook, which is great. It has three narrators. Um, pretty solid writing. I liked the twist, which is early on, so I'm going to say it, that the true love of her life is a woman, and the history, it's basically the history of Hollywood from the point of view of a Cuban by woman. I'm like maybe not as obsessed as everyone else, but I have also just read so much since then. I read Harbor Me by Jacqueline Woodson, her latest middle grade, and I also got to meet her this year because she was the national ambassador of young people's literature. And it's basically about a group of kids who get this space to talk about real issues at their school and touches on a lot of topics and it's just really great to think about from an like educator standpoint. And I read quite a bit of Discworld this year because my friend was really getting on to me about it because it's one of their favorite series. And they're writing fan fiction um, that apparently I have to read now. No. <laughs> so I think my favorite so far is Mort, which I kind of wish was my first book I read because there's fewer like subplots and characters. And it's basically about Death, who is a character who, yeah, speaks in all caps. It's great. He basically attempts to hire an assistant and has an existential crisis. It's great. So I also read a few books that were not released in 2019 that I really enjoyed. I finally got around to reading The Midnights by Sarah Nicole Santana. So I've really wanted to get to this book for a while, and I just haven't gotten to it. And then one day I was like, you know what? I'm going to read it. So it's about Susanna, who's a guitar-playing, songwriting teenager who loses her dad in a free car accident. So after her and her mom get uprooted to live with her grandmother in Southern California, and she works to reconnect to her dad and start to write music again and gets involved with a band of music playing misfits. I really enjoy books about music mm-hmm. and grief. So any books that have those two elements, I'm generally all over. So I really enjoyed it. And I really liked how the environment of California became kind of a character in it. Another book I really enjoyed was um, We Are the Ants by Sean David Hutchinson, who wrote Brave Face. So this is a surrealist book about Henry, who's a gay teenager who gets abducted by aliens and is given the choice to save humanity by pressing a red button or not. Um, And the book explores his worsening depression and suicidal ideation as he begins to fall for a boy, confront the ongoing pain and grief of his ex who died by suicide, and deal with all of his messy family problems, including his grandmother having Alzheimer's. It's very heavy and very dark, but I do think there's a through line of hope in it. I'm I'm glad I waited to read it because I think I really enjoyed it when I did read it. Yeah, I read this like three years ago, and I almost want to revisit and reread it. I might just rent the audiobook and reread it because I'm looking for an audiobook right now. I'm glad I read it after reading Brave Face. So I think if you're hesitant to read it, reading Brave Face and then reading We Already Ants is a smart decision. Because hmm. I think I understood the decisions that were made in We Already Ants because I read Brave Face first. And I felt like I trusted him as an author more after reading Brave Face. Mm-hmm. I also really enjoyed Ashley Herring Blake's other middle grade novel, Ivy Aberdeen's Letter to the World. It's the first of many queer girl middle grade novels that I read this summer. <laughs> And it is about a girl, Ivy, who loses her notebook of drawings of girls holding hands of other girls after a tornado destroys her house. And it is about how she's blackmailed to get the drawings back. But she's also navigating new friendships and turbulent relationships with her family because they literally lost their house because it was destroyed by a tornado. And then I just recently finished Spinning, which is a graphic memoir by Tilly Walden, who wrote On a Sun Meme, which Olivia enjoyed. And the book is about how she was a competitive figure skater for much of her childhood and how being queer and other events in her personal life influenced her skating and vice versa. Not going to lie, I thought the book was about ballerinas until right now. (laughs) I I saw the cover, but not the entire, like, not a big enough. They're wearing ice skates. Yeah, but you have to, like, not on the little thumbnail. I haven't, okay. So we both read Drumroll, Please. Also, which wasn't released this year by Elisa Jen Bigelow. And it's about a girl who goes to summer camp for, like, rock bands. 
and they get put together in a band and she's not with her best friend and that kind of, they have some conflict between them and also she's dealing with this new girl who she meets and they kind of fall for each other and so she's dealing with that new thing especially when her friend always wants to talk about guys and it really dealt with friendship conflict in a great way and lots of music references. I also read a Hazel Theory of Evolution, which is Lisa Jen Bigelow's newest middle grade, but I think I like Drumroll Please more. We're not huge movie fans. Maybe that will change in 2020. Maybe it will not. It really depends what comes out, I guess. But one movie that we both really enjoyed, mostly because I heckled Olivia to watch it, was Booksmart. Which is well, about- I wanted to watch it. I know, but I really like pushed you to watch it. I was just waiting for it to come out on Hulu because I never actually go to the movie theater, which is why I hardly see movies. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, Booksmart is about two good do two do gooder. Who wrote this? You. <laughs> that was the joke that you didn't laugh at. Two do gooder. There's to understand. And Molly, who decides to go to one wild party because they have always been very studious, well-mannered, good students before they graduate high school, and it sends them on a hilarious adventure that strains their perfect-seeming friendship. It definitely has good moments. It has, like, pretty good queer rep. There's it's very surreal. Issues. Yeah. Just, I don't know. I really related to Amy and her, like, okay, we're done now. Let's go home kind of thing. <laughs> And also, Amy was played by Caitlin Deaver, who, when this trailer was released, as someone who had seen a lot of seasons of Last Man Standing of As They Declined in Quality. She played the youngest child, and I think she still does. And I was like, when this trailer was released, I was like, oh, I've always wanted to see her play a deadpan lesbian. She did. So I put on this list, because we made this a while ago, If Feel Street Could Talk. And because of a war season, things get fuzzy about, like, it's like a limited release first and then a bigger release later because Oscar nomination, whatever. I still have only seen the first 30 minutes of this, which we watched in class because I've been busy. But those first 30 minutes were amazing. And again, I love Regina King, who was also in Watchmen and The Leftovers. So <laughs> moving on, at the beginning of this year, I saw The Favorite, which again, really state question mark because of award season. And it's a love triangle of political manipulation between Queen Anne, played by Olivia Coleman who is, again, an Oscar British darling. Her new, like, court hand, because I don't know what the official term is, played by Emma Stone, and then her, like, already established trusted court hand, Rachel Wise, and those two are cousins. And they're basically, like, vying to be her favorite. It's, like, all, like, they're, like, manipulating politics. And it also features, like, weird and stupid stuff, like duck races and throwing vegetables at a dancing naked man, because... The upper class did that stuff to amuse themselves. There's also some intense archery scenes. Tay has to watch that movie. So Rocket Man, I also have on here. I actually saw this movie because I had someone to see it with my dad in the theater on a rare occasion of <laughs> going to the theater. Uh, it, this is the Elton John biopic, which is kind of disguised as a jukebox musical and one long therapy session about his addiction. It's way more cinematically interesting than Bohemian Rhapsody and probably more accurate since Elton John himself worked on it. And like, it begins with a five-year-old El- Elton John singing the bitches back. Like, that's all I need to say. <laughs> so other movies include Noel. Um, it's a solid Christmas movie with tons of Christmassy puns. We have an entire episode about it. So if you want to know more about Noel, watch that. Basically, it's about Bill Hader not wanting to be Santa. And then Anna Kendrick, who plays his sister, goes after him in Phoenix, Arizona. Again, watch it. Listen to our episode about Weirdly it. It's similar to Barry. <laughs> yeah. You can listen to Olivia's whole conspiracy theory in that episode. Another movie that I really loved this year, which I saw very recently, was Little Women, which is the new Greta Gerwig directed adaptation of Louisa May Alcott's classic novel about sisters. Uh, Cher Shea Ronan, um, where's your Oscar going to be? <laughs> Hopefully in your hands on February 9th. She really steals the show, and she's my favorite like adaptation of Joe. It's great. It's like so visually delightful in every way. And I highly recommend that everyone see it. So fingers crossed for awards. I'm really interested in the interpretation of the characters because I read Little Women a long time ago when I was like in fifth grade, which was fine. And but I didn't get it. And then I saw a play this year that was my friend was in and 
I got way more interested in these characters. So I'm interested to see this interpretation because I've never seen another adaptation, although there are probably too many. I haven't read the book and I hadn't experienced, well, I read a few graphic novel Little Women retellings, but other than that, I didn't know anything about the characters and I'm obsessed with all of them. So you will enjoy it. Okay, interesting. Because I heard like it does, it makes Amy more understandable. Yeah, but I mean, I think to an extent. Yeah, I mean, just compared to other adaptations that you have not seen in the book. I I didn't really like Amy, but I understood. Well, obviously. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so also these are things that we watched in 2019 but were not like released in 2019 so one of them was the skeleton twins which was this indie movie that i watched and it kind of like broke me emotionally so i made tay watch it basically bill Hader and kristen wig are twins brought together by their suicidal depression because they've been estranged for like 10 years. And then there's lip sync scene to Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now, which is one of my favorite things that like brings me joy. And my brother won't reenact it with me. I'm upset about that. It's funny, but very serious. It's a sibling movie. And I was in from like Milo's very first line, which is, I'm a tragic gay cliche. <laughs> when she goes to visit him in the hospital. So I also watched... Eighth grade, which you have seen, mm-hmm. but I watched it this year. And that's Bo Burnham's exploration of anxiety through a girl played by Elsie Fisher, who's actually like the right, the same age, 14. And she has acne and like a normal body. And I love that. Um, like no makeup, obviously, at times. And it's like her last days of eighth grade. It's painfully tense and realistic. And it really showed that, or even if like the most dramatic and worst things don't happen, you still like can communicate so much feeling through cinematography i saw into the spider verse this year which tani swatch because she likes art way more than i do it like totally changes the game for animated movies i'm not super into like spider-man and stuff but it was great and i love miles so and his relationship with peter b parker <laughs> i saw one of Tane's favorite movies short term 12 yeah. this year which is currently on netflix fyi so it's into the spider verse in eighth grade is on Amazon, which is about like a group of teens kind of halfway, but be- like in f- between foster care situations. Yeah. At a short term facility for children who are wards of the state. Yeah. Yeah. And it features, and then like the adult characters it focuses on, and some of the teen characters. Caitlin Deaver is in it too. And a not yet famous Brie Larson and Rami Malik and Stephanie Beatriz. And John Gallagher Jr. from Spring Awakening. Mm-hmm. So, um, it's kind of wild. But it's very good about, like, trauma. Stuff I love. It's great. And also, speaking of trauma, I finally watched Lady Bird this year. And I loved it. So, I'm definitely on the Greta Gerwig and Cherche Ronan wagon. Yay. Maybe Timothy Chalamet. No, not really. <laughs> it's in both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. I'm not on his bandwagon. <laughs> I just want people to pronounce it Timote because I took French and that's what I see every time I see it. Me too. He just has too much sad boy energy for me and it's like, what do you have to be sad about? <laughs> <laughs> no, he also Lucas Hedges in that movie and maybe cry. So yes, he was much better in Lady Bird. But let's talk about our one true love musicals. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically, uh, for both of us on here, we have Hades Town, cause which actually started. I started listening off Broadway. I knew it was like had started on Broadway, but they like hadn't released the album yet or like even any clips. My friend was like, I had heard a little bit before, but I started with the off Broadway album and some of the original album because the off Broadway woman doesn't have every song because they only have one disc and it is, like, still one of my... I love seeing it evolve and just, like, everything about it. There will be an episode at one point. I can't even start. <laughs> We're not going to start that now. <laughs> I saw two days before the Tony Awards, and I have to say the biggest detriment to Hades Town was them not having the album ready because I feel like I would have stayed much more obsessed with it if the album had been out when I saw it. But I love yeah, it. Yeah, I was listening to the first recording that they had released, and, like, every release of that, I was like, oh, how are they going to, like, update it? Or, like, what did they change? That kind of thing. You see, my thing is, like, whenever I see a show, I want to be able to, like, experience the music from it. 
to relive it, and it was really hard to do that with that show. So. Yeah. And the music is fantastic, but so is just the story and themes and, like, literally every aspect of the design. So another one we have, the other one for both of us especially, is Little Shop of Horrors, which is not actually new to me. I saw it, like, seven years ago my freshman year of high school. They did it. It, like, blew my mind because I'd never seen a dark musical before. But I saw another version of it this year, which kind of rediscovered it because now I know, like, all of the references to the 1950s. And I really appreciated that. And, yeah, you had never seen it. I knew, like, two songs from it. My mom hates it, so I was never able to convince her to, like, see a production of it. And I just was, like, lazy and never saw the movie. So I saw the off-Broadway revival of it with Jonathan Groff and Christian Borle and I fell in love with it and because the original soundtrack was so good I was able to binge the music after seeing it and now I binge the actual cast album all the time so I really enjoyed it but anyway speaking of productions (laughs) um I also have like the other because I really didn't discover any new musicals besides Hades Town but one of the things that starting at the end of last year and the beginning of this year, I was really delving into and rediscovering was Next to Normal because uh, we did a production of it, like an undergrad theater company that I was a part of last semester, and it was amazing, and it basically owns my heart and soul. And the context the book and the dialogue gives to it, the music is fantastic, but the context is so important because I was a dramaturg, so I was like, okay, we got to make sure like we acknowledge the real science and the real because it can when you're talking about treatment of mental illness can be such a problem and you can perpetuate stigma right or come off as like flippant so it really does it so well like probably better than like any musical I've seen dealing with that stuff looking at like Dear Evan Hansen and Be More Chill and it was like it's like 10 years old now so I don't know happy decade so I discovered quite a few musicals and saw quite a few new musicals that many of you probably have not heard of. One you might have heard of is Moulin Rouge. So there's a Broadway spectacular production of it based on the movie, and they added new music to update it. And I'm kind of obsessed with the soundtrack still, especially their version of Chandelier. The Shut Up and Dance With Me and Raise Your Glass thing, which I was surprised. Oh, how much I'm obsessed with, obsessed with different songs, but that's interesting. I'm obsessed with the More, More, More at the end, which is their, like, encore, Chandelier, and Backstage Romance, which is a compilation of bad romance and a bunch of other kind of, like, oh. very strong female-written songs and some other music. It's a jukebox musical that, like, really does a good job of sewing together songs that you wouldn't think go together. Like the elephant love medley is what I was going to say. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> I was like, oh, I can recognize different songs in here. It was kind of a game. Another jukebox musical that I really enjoyed is in the UK right now. It's called Anne Juliet, and it's about William Shakespeare and Anne Hathaway rewriting Romeo and Juliet as it plays out on stage, I think. That's what I've garnered from all the videos I've watched this musical is about. And it's also like a mega pop hit jukebox musical. And it looks incredible. I have very little hope that it'll transfer to the U.S., but I would like to see it at some point. It also has a pop remix of a Bon Jovi song, which like I didn't think I would see in musical theater, but here we are in 2019, people. Um, another musical that I really love that I didn't expect to like was Oklahoma. Or Oklahoma. <laughs> or new Oklahoma. Oklahoma. It's closing soon, but I think this was like one of the showstoppers of 2019 Broadway. And I didn't expect to like, like, a golden age musical from the 40s, but it is incredibly done, and everyone is super talented. Um, Mary Tessa read one of my tweets about Stephanie Chu in a Tony's lead-up video, and that is, like, (laughs) fame to fame in 2019. So I also love the prom. I'm obsessed with the Tony's performance. I saw it twice. I am very emotional. And I love Caitlin Kinnan and Isabel McCalla, who were in Fun Home and a Funeral Home. So I was there. I got to see a reading of one of my favorite musicals by incredible actors. Jelani Aladdin laughed the entire time. <laughs> also, we have an episode on the prom. So you can find out why it's not on my list. <laughs> yes. It might but have we- been if I had seen it, but... Maybe. I have no other experience to connect to it. 
Don't worry. I'm going to make sure that Olivia experiences plenty of musicals in 2020. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So <laughs> some of my more obscure things I liked were Einstein's Dreams, which was a Prospect Theater production put on at 59E59, and it's based on the book, and it's all about Einstein discovering the theory of relativity. And the conceit of the story is that he has different dreams about different ways that time can work, and he eventually figures out that time is relative. Um, I also loved Love and Hate Nation, which was at Two River Theater in Red Bank. Support regional theater. Woo! Um, the songs I have heard from this are fantastic. Yeah. It's another Joe Iconis musical, but it's not going to be as popular because it actually centers, like, strong, developed female characters instead of super milk toasty white dudes in suburban New Jersey. Um, it's about delinquents in a kind of mental institution who rebel against status quo. In the 60s, and it is great, and it's queer, and it's great. <laughs> and, and the music then, is quite different, too, from Be More Chill. I think if it's more of a rock musical, if you're, like, not sure about the music. Yeah. A, and then I saw Sarah Bareilles and Waitress in January. Or I'm going to see it in February, though. I know. I'm excited for you to see it. Okay, so let's go over music really quickly. Yeah, because uh, music is a thing I don't listen to much of, although I think I did more this year. So mostly I just mostly the Hades Town. First it was the Off-Broadway, now it's the Broadway cast album. Like all the time, I honestly prefer that one, even the new Chance. And Ben Platt, who released his debut album, and we recorded our first release podcast about it. And I saw uh, him in concert. I saw him in Philly and Radio City. So that was like the one new music that I enjoyed, so I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> I discovered King Princess kind of recently and briefly. Mostly, I think, Hit the Back is a bop. Haven't listened to everything. I also appreciate Lizzo and Maggie Rogers. And these are all people who are bigger for others. But, like, I'm still kind of stuck in the 90s because mostly I discovered Natalie Merchant, Tori Amos, and even more R.E.M. So... <laughs> So I fell in love with Sarah Brells' music, and I saw her in concert. Um, I listened to a lot of, like, early 2000s alternative rock, and I don't really, like, stray from that. And I also listen to a lot of show tunes. I mostly listen to oldies and show tunes. So I listen to a lot of stuff that wasn't new to me this year, like Spring Awakening, A New Brain, and Company. So other things. Okay, so we have a few comedy things on here. We have Daniel Sloss, who... I can't remember if I first watched this stuff this year or last year. You definitely watched it this year. Yes. There will be an episode. So, Daniel Sloss is hands down my favorite comedian right now. I became obsessed with Jigsaw and Dark because I was helping my friend Cody with his comedy final. And I watched a trailer for Jigsaw in the bathroom at the Hoboken train station at 11 o'clock at night. And I was like, what is this? I need to watch the whole thing. So I did, and I'm like, oh, someone has, like, the same level of dark humor that I do, and there's not (laughs) something deeply wrong with me. Or if there is, at least there's other people who are like me. And he Um, also deals with, like, real things like grief and rape culture and, like, relationships. Yes. And a little bit about mental illness, and I'm really hoping we get more about mental health and mental illness from him in the future, but we'll see. So I also, I saw him live in 2019. I saw him do his comedy special Now, which I don't think has been picked up by Netflix, or it might have been. I don't know if it's ever going to see the light of day. But I also kind of like that I saw this Daniel Sloss thing that not everyone has access to. And his whole special was about um, the idea of whether or not he's a sociopath. And he talks a lot about emotion versus logic. And then he has a great bit where he connects talking about giving people orange juice with pulp in it without asking them if they want orange juice with pulp in it to sending unsolicited dick pics. So I feel like (laughs) now is a really great stepping stone between Jigsaw and X, and I'm really glad I got to experience it. But X is definitely my favorite. Yeah, I think so, too. And now I think was bought by Netflix. I also think this was the year I discovered Bo Burnham, now that I think about it, because I watched AP Raid. And I really loved Make Happy. At first, I didn't quite get his stuff. But then, like, with that one, I think you do. And that one's on Netflix, so I recommend. So another one that I introduced to Tay, and now she's she loves, is um, the comedian Gary Goldman, And particularly his new special, The Great Depression. Yes. So 
Gary Goldman had kind of like a comedy special slash like biopic. Yeah, like there's this interludes he, that are filmed where he's like in his apartment and stuff. Yeah. So it's his return to comedy and he explains his recovery process from severe depression. And I appreciate and that we have these male comedians who are breaking down a lot of the toxic culture in comedy through sharing their own vulnerable experiences. And it's also funny. He also had anxiety, too. And, yeah. Oh, he also had ECT treatment, electroconvulsive therapy done, which I really appreciate him talking about because after all the research on Next to Normal, there's, like, very little actually accurate, not cuckoo's nest level understanding of that in the modern day. So one of my favorite things of 2019 was the comeback of the SpongeBob musical broadcast on Nickelodeon. And it really answered my problem, which is that I didn't want to see the SpongeBob musical on tour because I couldn't imagine seeing that musical with any other people than the original cast. <laughs> like I just can't imagine SpongeBob, the SpongeBob musical without Ethan Slater playing SpongeBob or Danny Skinner playing Patrick. So they filmed it live for Nickelodeon. And I feel like this is really the answer to, like, the rent problem that started 2019 off, which is that these, like, elaborate stage broadcasts of musicals don't really I think work. they kind of stopped it after that one because that one wasn't live. Yeah. but <laughs> Although like, it had just, great set design. It did, but, like, and just filming musicals and making them more accessible to people is a good thing. And it makes me so angry when I see actors saying that, like, it destroys the integrity of the theater. And it's <laughs> like, no, like, yes, it's still a special experience, and nothing can replace seeing a musical in a theater. But I think there is also something special about making the actual art form of people on a stage singing more accessible to people who wouldn't have it otherwise. Yeah, and it makes them more interested in it, too, I think. And it also preserves those productions, so, yes. you know. And also, um, I watched it with my 10-year-old cousin on Christmas because we both love SpongeBob, the SpongeBob musical. And he saw it twice on Broadway, and I saw it four times on Broadway, and we still enjoyed seeing it again together. So just, mm -hmm. like, get your act together, U.S., and, like, film things and <laughs> make them more accessible. Yeah, I still have to watch it. I still have to watch it. Another thing I think you watched with your cousin on Christmas was John Mulaney and the Sack Lunch a bunch. Yeah, I had to watch it again, but from what I was able to, like, actually hear through all the chaos, I really enjoyed. Uh, Andre de Shields of Hades Town is in it, and there's a whole thing about just very relatable stuff, like grandma's got a boyfriend and uh, plain plated noodles with a little bit of butter. <laughs> Yeah, and they ask their kids what they're and the adults like what they're afraid of and stuff. So it's like existential, but with kids. <laughs> well, my little cousin really enjoyed it. So if you have a ten year old, a lot of Broadway kids are in it too. So yeah, so I got to be part of a Broadway play this year. So the day after the Alabama abortion law got passed, I decided it was a good idea to wear my. Girls Just Want to Have Fundamental Rights shirt from the Cindy Lauper True Colors Foundation to rush a ticket for what the Constitution means to me. I got a front row aisle seat. I bought a drink as soon as I got there. And I had seen this show off-Broadway in 2018, so I knew the structure of the show, and I knew that someone got picked in the audience to read the announcement at the end. And what happened was the first time I saw it, the guy next to me got picked, and I was really just, like, too chicken to, like, volunteer and do it. So I'm like, no, this is my moment. So now I'm, like, properly buzzed at the end of this 90-minute this <laughs> play. That's about um, Heidi Schreck's experience of touring the country and talking about the Constitution as she talks about what the Constitution means today. And they have a debate over whether the Constitution should be abolished or not, and then they pick an audience member to read the decision. So, of course, I get picked wearing the shirt in the front row. So now Tipsy Tay stands up, takes the microphone, and <laughs> faces a Broadway theater of 500 people and reads the decision to abolish the Constitution, and it was great. We all needed it that night. I gave the people what they needed. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I have two more short 
comedy discoveries before we sign out. I really got into comedy this year because I think I needed a little bit of a break. And, like, just how words are put together that and, like, how situations can be flipped to be funny, I find so interesting for, like, a language and, uh, like, writing perspective. So I discovered Julio Torres, who is currently a writer on SNL and has done some sketches like Wells for Boys, if you have seen that, or the recent, like, Sarah Lee Instagram sketch with Harry Styles. He's actually in that one as the boy he's randomly obsessed with. And his whole sense of humor is this, like, weird, magical absurdism, often with objects. So he has an HBO special called My Favorite Shapes. And he and Fred Armisen and another comedian, Anna Fabrega, created a show called Los Spookies for HBO, which is bilingual, mostly in Spanish and sometimes in English with Spanish subtitles. So there's always subtitles. And it's very strange. And but very entertaining. (laughs) Like, I don't know. It's kind of like a dream. (laughs) And then the last thing I have, which I wasn't going to put on, I had on here. I deleted it. And then they uploaded a compilation on the official SNL page this morning on YouTube. So I was like, well, I got to put it in so I can link to it, which is a collection of like digital short SNL sketches from 2006 to 2000, like, 12 I think there's six of them they're called laser cats and basically the conceit is that Bill Hader and Andy Samberg are like hey Lauren Michaels check this out we made this really terrible short film about cats who shoot lasers and there's like space and they riff on different things there's always and they're just really badly edited there's like obvious mistakes sometimes the cats are real and sometimes they aren't like in between takes but what I really liked about it is that it's just so middle school and we did this project spring semester where we quite literally took Happy Meal toys, sawed them apart, and, like, glued them back together, created our own characters, made a story, and attempted to film it and edit it, because that's, like, a thing you can do with kids, like, that's literacy-related. And so we were running around the School of Ed, and this is basically that. Like, they were running around the NBC studios (laughs) filming something incredibly silly. That, and then these two actors just went on to make, like, two of my favorite shows I mentioned earlier with Brooklyn Nine-Nine and Barry. So it cracks me up. Hopefully 2020 brings even more books, musicals, other things, comedy, TV, music that we enjoy. And I look forward to another year of making podcasts with you. Hey, and talking about this stuff. Hey listeners, we hope that you're having a great start to 2020 and we are grateful that you took time to listen to our podcast at the beginning of the year. If you want to support Culture Pops Open, you can follow us on social media. You can follow the podcast on Instagram at Culture Pops Open and you can follow us on Twitter at CPO underscore podcast. If you want to keep up with us individually, you can follow Tay on Twitter and Instagram at Tayberry Jelly. And you can follow Olivia on Twitter at Books and Big Ideas and on Instagram at Books underscore Big Ideas. Please also consider donating to our Patreon or becoming a patron for as little as a dollar a month to help us cover our hosting fees and to support the podcast as we get better equipment and whatnot. We're so grateful that you listen to our podcast and we look forward to making more episodes for you soon.